So I think we need something completely new to understand uh, what replaces the Big Bang. Here we are. Okay, so uh, welcome everyone who is listening and watching. And it's uh, my pleasure to uh, chat and uh, have this dialogue on the foundations with uh, Robert Brandenberger, who is a professor at McGill in Montreal, Canada, um, and uh, um, is a theoretical cosmologist and uh, well-known, in fact, renowned and influential and uh, somebody that I would be the pleasure to learn uh, a lot from and uh, interact with. So um, let's uh, start off. Uh, first of all, thank you for... Uh, well, thank you for inviting me to chat. Yeah, it's a good pleasure. And uh, it's always a pleasure to chat with you, in fact. And uh, so we start with uh, introducing uh, why we are chatting about the foundations of cosmology, um, which is going to be the topic of our uh, uh, conversation. So people who are not doing research on cosmology or not uh, attentively uh, checking the archive and, and, and all of that is going on, could think that, no, things are settled. We have an amazing uh, understanding of the history of the universe uh, down to the, you know, back to the very beginning. And, um, you know, there is uh, inflation that explains uh, the very beginning. And then we know how, you know, stars formed, how galaxies formed, and how things are evolving. And we managed even to bypass the shock of knowing that the universe has a history and is, and is expanding and evolving and it has some finite um, size and or maybe a finite time, a finite life span. Um, is AB so cool and easy and understood? So not not at all in my opinion. But let me first start out with uh, why I think cosmology is interesting and uh, worthwhile working on, and also why it should be interesting for the for the general public. Good idea. So, um, cosmology is sort of a mixture of age-old speculation, namely about what is the origin of the universe, um, was there a beginning. If, if not, what was before, what we think was the beginning. So there, there are all these philosophical questions. What is space and time? But then we now have lots of data about the structure of the universe that we observe. And uh, we would like to explain this data. So it's beautiful data. So I think it is this combination of hard data that needs to be explained and deep questions which border on philosophy, maybe in theology. Mm -hmm. This, in my opinion, makes the, the subject very, very interesting. It's, it's quite amazing in itself uh, that those big questions about the universe uh, uh, have become uh, somehow scientific, something that uh, are beyond just theology and philosophy. And But let me now turn to your question, actually. Yep. So um, you set out in a provocative way what is the standard dogma of early universe cosmology. No. No. What, and what uh, if you open a modern textbook on astronomy, you will indeed read that the, the universe began with a big bang and that then there was a period of inflation, which means that uh, the size of the universe expands exponentially like uh, prices of things you buy in the store expand exponentially during the period of inflation. Mm -hmm. So this is a standard paradigm, but uh, it is not at all established. So first of all, let's turn to the Big Bang itself. So what the way that you phrase the Big Bang, by that you imply that there was a beginning of time. And at the beginning of time, the temperature was infinite and the density of matter was infinite. Now, these infinite quantities simply do not make sense from the point of view of physics. Because if you imagine 
an experimentalist wanted to measure something that something large. Well, an experimentalist can measure something large, but an experimentalist will never measure infinity. So if, if the measuring device shows infinity, it just means that there's something that went wrong with the measuring device. So the fact that our standard paradigm has infinities, it simply, in my view, it means that we do not understand the very beginning. Mm -hmm. So that's number one. Now, number two, we simply do not know whether inflation indeed happened. And indeed, inflation was a model that w for the quite early universe that was proposed and that solved some of the problems of our previous paradigm, which was just the plain old standard Big Bang theory. But there are alternatives. And in fact, it's proven to be very hard to come up with a theory of inflation as opposed to simply a toy model. So in my opinion, inflation has not been established and there are alternatives. Let, 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 me, let me then ask another apparently provocative question, but I'm entirely peaceful and, and uh, non-provocative, okay? So, fine, okay, there may be things that we do not understand, uh, but uh, why are they supposed to be fundamental issues, so somehow pointing to big misunderstandings about the universe and our and the fundamental principles of physics so why is it not just that uh, okay maybe the specific model a specific model of inflation or some other model is not perfect we need to adjust it but at the end is uh, you know usual science uh, you you cook up a mathematical model you check if it fits uh, and what's foundational about all of that uh, why is it not just technical issues that we have to solve so the question about the singularity that occurs in inflation, in our inflation models, that is a foundational question. That means that there's something we simply do not understand. It's not just something that uh, we, we have a model which is maybe not uh, perfect, but this is something that says that uh, the starting point is uh, not there. There's a missing starting point. Mm -hmm. Uh, would you say when it comes to inflation? Whether... Yeah, sorry. It's uh, ju just uh, uh, then I, I let you go. But uh, so related to that is whether is the these foundational issues uh, do they point uh, really to the breakdown of the overall framework that we use? You know, uh, semi-classical physics, uh, effective field theory. Do we have reasons to believe that we really have to change the basic principles of our? theories of the universe uh, and not just uh, models is a complement to my previous question. So I think we need something completely new to understand uh, what replaces the Big Bang. Now, whether the later universe will be well described by something that we now study, that we now have, that's a different question. But it may very well be true that that once we understand fundamental principles better, then suddenly there'll be something that looks like inflation and something that looks like what uh, is uh, written in, in astronomy textbooks as a standard model. But it may also be not. That it may be that there's something very different. But now you're playing the diplomatic person. But I've heard you in talks uh, saying that inflation itself it somehow points uh, or requires uh, something that goes beyond, uh, you know, usual uh, effective field theory, and that cannot be fully understood within uh, usual effective field theory. What's, what was the issue there? Right. So I actually claim that our models of inflation have fundamental problems, like uh, they are inconsistent with conservation of probability and. Uh, so some people may know what entropy means. Entropy is disorder. Entropy always increases. Mm -hmm. But um, uh, there's a problem with this uh, so-called second law of thermodynamics if you want to connect inflation with the late universe. This is what I claim. Um, but um, 
So now these, I should also mention that these uh, objections that I have against inflation are not universally accepted by the community. And so I'd like to go back to the stronger point, which should be universally accepted, mm -hmm. namely that inflation is only one of several possibilities. Mm -hmm. And uh, some people may find inflation the most elegant, other people not. And ultimately, we should be able to distinguish using experiments, but which were uh, correct. I understand, but so you, uh, what you're also saying, uh, maybe more implicitly, is that uh, the current data, however amazing they are and, and precise and so on, do not allow us yet to distinguish uh, between these alternatives and to choose one uniquely. Uh, that's right. That, that's right. So in fact, when, from a historical perspective, one has to give inflation credit for having predicted things that have, that were later uh, verified. Mm -hmm. So uh, similar thing happened with standard Big Bang cosmology. It predicted a cosmic microwave background. Many people thought there wouldn't be one. There couldn't be one. But then it was discovered. Can you uh, say what was that? Sorry? Can you say what is that? The CMB, the Cosmological Micro... Oh, because I pretend I know, but... Uh, other people yes, that's right. Know. So good. So if we look at the sky using, um, not with optical telescopes, but with radio telescopes, then we see a glow that comes from all parts of the sky, a uniform glow that corresponds to a temperature of about three degrees... Um, above absolute zero, which is even oh. called by Montreal standards. And Munich standards, I can tell you. By Munich standards right now, yes, as well. So this is, uh, and also uh, um, we've measured uh, the wavelength dependence of this radiation, and it fits what physicists call the black body. And uh, this was all predicted by the standard Big Bang model before it was measured. But then later on, uh, we found out that there were things that the standard Big Bang model does, did not explain. Mm -hmm. And so then inflation came around and inflation explained some of the things which the previous model did not explain, and it made predictions. and. So we, just can we make a couple of examples of, uh, you know, people hear uh, about maybe the, I don't know, the horizon problem or structure formation or the flatness problem. What are these problems that cosmological models have to explain? So let's start, let me start with um, the, what we call the size problem. So we observe a huge universe today. This uh, 13... And so it takes light 13 million years to travel from one side of, of the visible universe to the other. And there's a huge amount of matter there. But if we want to explain this coming from some small explosion, then this is a huge problem. So this is one of the problems. Another problem is uh, why does the does space to us look like space that we can describe in uh, what you learn in uh, geometry, using Euclidean geometry. Why does our three-dimensional space look flat and why isn't it like the three-dimensional analog of the surface of a, of a ball? Yeah, if I can, if I can briefly add the point about this, uh, you know, flatness, uh, Euclidean uh, uh, description. It's a bit, uh, it's intriguing that, uh, you know, for now, now is a problem that things look flat and Euclidean, which means that we really uh, absorb the lesson of uh, general relativity and, and, you know, that uh, instead uh, was a big shock at the beginning that the universe uh, may not be just flat and can actually be curled and non-Euclidean. 
and then we describe the universe uh, overall with a non-Euclidean geometry, including time, and then indeed uh, it looks still flat uh, regarding space, and that now is a puzzle. Why is it that among all the possibilities allowed by the theory, uh, we, we ended up with a flat uh, space? Right, because if you start, if at the big, if, if at the time of the Big Bang, mm -hmm. the universe is like a little ball, then it could never have grown to be at our size. In fact, it would have recollapsed mm -hmm. before any life could have developed. Mm -hmm. And so problems like this are indeed explained by the theory of inflation. And what about the horizon problem? What is that? So, okay, so when I started out uh, this talk, I mentioned that we would like to explain the structure that we observe in the universe. That, so, we, for example, we would like to explain the distribution of galaxies in three-dimensional space. And we now see galaxies very far away, and uh, the distribution of galaxies has patterns, very specific patterns. And we would like to explain where this, these patterns come from, who create these patterns. Mm -hmm. And in the standard Big Bang model, it is uh, impossible to have a uh, explanation which physicists would accept. And because. by that, tech, with the technical term, is causal. Mm -hmm. You have to, in the standard Big Bang model, you'd have to find it causality in order to, to explain these patterns. But in inflation, you can, you have a mechanism that predicts these uh, patterns. Uh, would that be correct to say that the, 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 the issue is that uh, these patterns have to do with somehow the, the behavior and the structures of the uh, galaxies uh, to be uh, somehow correlated as if they had been in touch with each other, I mean, communicating with each other, but uh, the, in many cases they are so distant from one another they, they could not have communicated in the in the early universe that's, that's a that's a way to put it okay uh no just correct me if i'm entirely wrong i'm not an apology but that's it. <laughs> okay fine and 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 um we mentioned the the possibility maybe even the necessity to to that uh, we will need some uh, uh entirely different framework for uh, fundamental physics uh, uh, with respect to the one we use, at least for the early universe, the very early universe. And we mentioned also the uh, singularity issue, the issue with Big Bang and explaining what really goes on at, at what we call Big Bang. Um, now, here I'm biased uh, because I would say, well, of course, we need the theory of quantum gravity. We need some more fundamental uh, theory unifying uh, quantum mechanics and gravitational uh, physics. Uh, would you agree with that? Or is it me be totally biased? No, I, I, I agree with that. Okay. I agree with that because we have four forces in nature. Gravity is the fourth. The other three we know we have to describe quantum mechanically. And if we want a unified picture of the early universe, then all four forces are important and they have to be described on the same footing. So it means, to me, it means that uh, gravity has to be described quantum mechanically. And would you say that this is uh, exactly what is needed to, to understand better the singularity, the what, what goes on at the Big Bang? Uh, that, that's... that's... No. I hope that this is the case, but I can vouch for it until we have a convincing uh, theory. You say that just because we are recording, or uh, or uh... no, 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 no. I um, not. I think one has to be. Um... See, there are also different approaches to quantum gravity. Mm -hmm. And so one of the reasons why I, I guess I'm, I'm hedging my bets here is that I don't think any of the models of quantum gravity we now have are really worked out in full detail. Okay. So therefore it is, I think, a bit premature to say that the, singular, the singularity problem can be, can be solved. But it's definitely one driving hope. 
But now you see, there are things that we don't understand about our present universe as well. So you might even argue that we need a new paradigm to understand the late universe. And I'm now referring to what people call dark energy. So, and again, dark energy is a fancy word, and but this word is as fancy and undefined to physicists as it is to the lay people. Because to quote one uh, cosmologist, the only thing we know about dark energy is that it is there and that we don't know what it is, that we don't know anything about what it is. So anyway, dark energy... If I can add a small joke, I mean, this, which is certainly true, that doesn't mean that we don't have a, a very large set of models of what it could possibly be. So we, this, this, the fact that we do not understand at all what it is didn't stop us from producing a, an immense amount of... Uh, uh, models uh, more or less convincing maybe less convincing when it comes to when it comes to dark energy I would actually say less convincing see when it comes to the singularity problem at the beginning of the universe I think that different approaches to quantize the reality they have they show promise they show great promise to be able to solve that problem whereas for dark energy I don't see any such problem realized yet, although I have hopes. I see. And let me voice another uh, uh, point uh, that it is always raised in, in connection to quantum gravity and cosmology, uh, at least to some quantum gravity uh, approaches and cosmology, which is this uh, other fancy word, uh, the, the multiverse. Uh, What's your take on that? Do we have to take it seriously as uh, lay people? Or is, it, is there a substance to it? And where does that substance come from? Okay, here I'm quite opinionated. I, I will say no. And first of all, so when people talk about the multiverse, they basically mean different universes uh, but this, um, beyond what we can observe today and what we will ever be able to observe with telescopes. So, now, something like that, in my opinion, does not fall in the realm of physics. Mm -hmm. Because physics deals with things that we can, at least in principle, observe and do measurements on. Mm -hmm. So now we can speculate. So now I've moved the multiverse from away from physics into a different domain, like philosophy or something like that. And that doesn't mean that it's disappeared. Uh, so it may live a fruitful life there, but now you can... Um, so some people have looked models, and I emphasize models as opposed to theories. So mathematical models, which, which they say predict multiverses. So they predict that in the early universe, um, branches of the universe will form. Only one of them becomes our own. And there will be many parallel uh, universes that we will never be able to explore. But it might be there. Okay, so in, in my opinion, there is no... These models are not consistent. So I'd claim that there are no consistent physical models for a multiverse in... Um, in contradiction with what some other people would say. But in fact, there, there are quite a few such people because uh, the, 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 the label multiverse is, uh, is, re is used, uh, you know, from string theory to discuss, uh, you know, the possible uh, vacua or the possible solutions of, uh, of the theory. Uh, in uh, in cosmology, in the context of inflationary models, uh, and sometimes some people even relate uh, these two a priori distinct uh, notions of multiverse uh, to to the ones coming from uh, many worlds uh, quantum mechanics. And uh, I have to say outright that uh, I'm not convinced at all that there is any relation between these three notions. Uh, so the one you are referring to, I guess, is the cosmological one, the one that is. I'm also referring to. I mean, the, the one which you labeled string theoretic 
Okay, the landscape. The, the landscape, right, the landscape. So, so first of all, since we do not understand uh, string theory uh, beyond knowing how strings scatter, mm -hmm. we don't know what it means to have a vacuum state of string theory. Mm -hmm. So therefore, these um, claims about this huge uh, set of grand states of string theory, mm -hmm. they are basically... Uh, this is fantasy in my in my view. It is not well motivated. So let, let's make an analogy. Um, let's take a landscape on the surface of the earth. So Bavaria, for example, there, there are many valleys and many hills and many mountains. And uh, the lands, the countryside looks different depending on which valley you are, which mountain you are. Now, um, these different valleys are not different universes. They are just uh, configurations of one uh, of, uh, of the of the local sums of the earth. Mm -hmm. And so if we live somewhere, we live in a particular valley. So we, we will see the universe in a particular way. So any theory will have different um, ground states. This is. And so there's nothing special about, uh, that, about the fact that string theory is different, might have different ground states. Yes. And, 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 but this is uh, uh, very different from the notion of multiverse uh, coming from uh, some inflationary models, right? That's right. So now, right. Dependent universes. Yep. yep. Okay, so now when it comes to um, the inflationary multiverse, the inflationary multiverse is based on calculations where you where you say you have fields, and uh, crucial is that you allow quantum mechanics to push the field up a potential. Mm -hmm. That's absolutely crucial to get in this inflationary multiverse. And this process is actually uh, not consistent with other c calculations. Mm -hmm. So, in fact, uh, you, can, you can show that in regions of the model, not theory of the model, where it is claimed that you can get an inflationary multiverse, you can show that um, the calculations are not consistent. Other terms in equations, which are more important than the terms that will give you the multiverse, have been neglected. I understand. So, as a disclaimer, we we both and you even more, we have many inflationary friends. Uh, we 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 like uh, all of those words, and we're just being uh, you know fair in our uh, attempt uh, at an assessment. Uh, of, of what goes on, as as you said earlier, I mean uh, there is a reason why so many people work in that uh, type of paradigm, the inflationary context, because there are many things that are actually explained by by this type of models, and then indeed we have to go a little bit deeper, and then problems start, uh, and there is more work uh, needed. But see, when it comes to the multiverse, I think um, a lot of a lot of serious people who did fundamental contributions to inflation would completely agree with what I said. For example, Slava Bukhanov in Vilni. We are completely on the same on the same page. Sure. And uh, yeah, let me uh, I I know you are opinionated and, and probably uh, given your previous answer about the multiverse, you're going to be opinionated about this as well. In connection to the multiverse, and, and very often uh, in connection to cosmology more generally, people uh, invoke uh, uh, something called the anthropic principle, and somehow the argument that uh, a new way of uh, uh, answering uh, scientific questions uh, beyond just uh, computing results of a model uh, is needed. Uh, so, uh, can you say in, in a couple of words what this anthropic uh, uh, principle is, well, and what 
uh, what what role it could play according to these people and why you, I guess you disagree. If you disagree, maybe you misunderstood uh, your your. No, no, I I I was just uh, thinking about how I'll approach it. So um, we talked about dark energy, which is this mysterious component. Um, this could be what physicists call a cosmological constant. And a cosmological constant is um, something that acts like energy of the vacuum, energy density of the vacuum. It is constant in space, constant in time, and it causes the universe to, to grow tremendously rapidly. And in spite of that, the energy density stays constant. So it's strange. You, not on that, if you expand, then the density goes down. But for this strange self thing called vacuum energy, mm -hmm. um, the value stays the same. So now uh, we would like dark energy may be this cosmological constant. And then you, you would like to ask uh, why we would like to find an explanation for, for the magnitude for the observed magnitude of dark energy. So this is something we can measure. And so according to the anthropic principle, uh, any value of this cosmological constant, any value of the density of dark energy is allowed. But it is simply that um, if it were different than what we measure it, then no humans would be present to measure it. So that's sort of the anthro anthropic principle. This is uh, not uh, one of the reasons why I'm sorry to interrupt. On, uh, I mean, up on explanation. No, so let let me interrupt you very briefly. Uh, so you could make this a similar type of observation about many other aspects of of, of the world, right? I mean, uh, th there's probably many other physical constants uh, or uh, you know phenomena which uh, if they were different or of a different magnitude they would make life as we know it uh, impossible uh, and in particular human life uh, impossible so uh, you're 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 mentioning uh, one example of uh, of a more general kind of reasoning that you think could uh, could follow right right so so i think this is not a physical explanation. It doesn't mean that the problem is not there. So uh, just to complete, so the story would, would be that uh, the fact that uh, a different value, the cosmological constant or the vacuum energy would make life impossible is then used as somehow reversing the, the logic as an explanation for uh, why the value has to be that one. Right. Or we observe. Right. Okay. Understood. Yes. This has sort of don't, don't accept. Mm -hmm. I see. Okay, for me, there's a uh, there's a boundary between what physics can explain and all the rest, which you cannot explain. Mm -hmm. And um, I don't know where this boundary is. And we. It's, it is a nice uh, challenge to try to push to see if we can explain more things than we with physics than we thought previously. And it maybe turns out that they, this cosmological constant we cannot explain using physics. This is a possibility. But um, I actually am hopeful that there will be an explanation in this sense. And listen, let, let me... Um change a little bit to the context uh, uh, but in fact uh, as i think it will be become clear in a second is very much related to this possible limitation of our explanatory powers and our you know understanding um so we discussed a number of foundational issues which have to do somehow with the with the content of cosmological uh, models you know the very early universe, the singularity, the early expansion, uh, the cosmic microwave background, uh, and now you you introduce also the issue of the late uh, acceleration, the late time acceleration that we see now. I mean, the is uh, discussed in term in the context of uh, dark energy cosmological constant, but 
there may be there may be things that are peculiar about cosmology and of foundational importance, which have to do more with the methodology, with the kind of science that cosmology is. At least I've seen this uh, debated uh, many, many times. I mean, uh, let me put it in the simplest possible manner. Uh, it's true we have a lot of data now uh, from uh, cosmology, the CMB spectrum, uh, all sorts of, uh, you know, the supernovae, the, the, the uh, observations of galaxies and galaxy clusters and their dynamics and, and all of that. But isn't it the case that uh, this set of data is still extremely small, limited, compared to what would be needed to really somehow guide us in a, in a, in a strong way towards uh, our, you know, uh, theory construction. I mean, to, to, is it, aren't we facing a strong uh, so-called underdetermination of theory by data? And this will somehow explain why there are so, so many models. Uh, uh, and uh, this, it's unclear what could stop this proliferation of, uh, of models for good or bad. Uh, would you agree that uh, cosmology is uh, severely underdetermined by by data. Well, historically, it was under the tongue. So cosmology was basically theoretical speculation mm -hmm. until the microwave background was discovered. And uh, then it was underdetermined when the problems of the standard Big Bang model were first being discussed. That's when inflation was, uh, the theory of inflation was proposed, and its predictions were worked out. Now, actually, we really have um, a lot of observations, and we have things which I think are um, not yet explained. Mm -hmm. At the moment, I think we are transiting away from this underdetermination. But but so you wouldn't agree uh, that it's a peculiar science. You would say it's uh, you know it's science uh, like the rest of physics. I mean it's uh, uh, is w wouldn't you say that there is something peculiar about the universe as a physical system? I tell you what I have in mind uh, that there is just one of it. Uh, that, that there's no possibility of doing experiments in the usual sense in which we control all the. Uh, you know, uh, we can isolate our system and control everything that uh, uh, concerns that system, and then we can do a measurement, and then we can do it again, and then we can do it again, and then we do usual statistical uh, analysis. Uh, somehow, uh, th first of all, there's just one universe. Uh, so whatever we want to say about the universe uh, is about uh, coming from our models, uh, is a statement about a single object, a single physical system, is not the same as, you know, when we study electrons in, in an accelerator uh, or, uh, you know, some condensed matter system in the lab. Uh, so that, 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 that's, that's one. And then uh, the fact that indeed that we, we only have observations rather than experiments, uh, I would find that also peculiar. And uh, finally, somehow the fact that uh, we observe, uh, say, the microwave background, meaning we measure some photons uh, that uh, arrive to us with a certain wavelength. Uh, if we were to look again in the same direction, strictly speaking, is different photons arriving to us. This is also quite peculiar. We, we cannot really repeat uh, the same observation uh, again. Uh, I, don't think, uh, I don't think I agree with some of the things you said here. Okay, in, good. I don't agree with the last. Because if you do an, a tabletop experiment or an accelerator experiment, then you are every time you do the experiment, you you you're, you have different particles, like the different photons that you mentioned. Mm -hmm. So now the one difference is that um, we we don't live long enough to do experiments over a long time scale compared to the life of the universe. You never know. We we never know, but for now, for now, we, we, we for now we for now we don't. So, so there's a practical dif difference there, and I think the main difference is that we are not we are internal to this to the universe. 
we are not to the to the um, experimental hull, and that is a, that there is a difference. So it's more a matter of a different perspective that uh, forces us to do things a little bit differently, uh, rather than uh, the universe being as such a, a peculiar physical system. So there's one universe, and in that universe we measure many different things and many galaxies. And you, you can say that there are uh, many different experiments that you do in an accelerator, but uh, all the, acceler the accelerator is always on the same Earth. Is it? So I, I think that some people overestimate the difference between cosmology Is it? and other, other sciences. But, but you... there I must, get, uh, I must confess that I have not thought very much about this issue. Is that? And uh, what about this other thing that uh, is mentioned in connection to what I said, which is uh, the so-called cosmic variance? What was what, what, that? Now I really don't know. It's uh, I'm not even... Uh, so, so you see, we have one universe. And if we, <clears throat> if we look, for example, at the difference between the north and the south hemisphere, we only have celestial uh, hemisphere, we only have one measurement of that. Now, some of the theories are based on uh, quantum processes where you compute probabilities of things that happen. And so in, in such a theory, you'll, have a, you'll be able to calculate a probability that the difference between the northern and the celestial hemisphere and the southern celestial hemisphere is such and such. But you... And cosmic variance, that basically means that um, the theory predicts a distribution and we only have one measurement. In, in the example that I gave. Mm -hmm. So, but this is uh, indeed related to the to the challenge I was mentioning earlier that uh, we w uh, we are dealing with the sin single instance of, uh, of 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 the experiment and uh, the system. We cannot repeat it, strictly speaking, or having an ensemble of universe to do usual statistical analysis. And so, we have to think even in statistical terms differently than in when dealing with an ensemble of identical systems. Right, but if you if you look now at the, the scales of galaxies, then the difference is it has a, is no longer important. So, okay, so you 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 manage to sleep at night uh, despite uh, the cosmic variance. Yes, definitely. That's very good. <laughs> let me uh, let me mention to conclude the the, the last point. Uh, uh, I, I said uh, to, to people who were asking me about this uh, initiative of the dialogues and uh, with, with experts from different areas of fundamental physics and, and philosophy and foundations of physics, that one purpose is to, is to somehow clarify to, to people who listen how science works uh, by, by just you know showing uh, in, in the open our doubts and, and uh, you know the way we think uh, the challenges we face when we when we do science and I would say that there is one challenge that is often uh, not appreciated enough by people who are not scientists that I think uh, is uh, common to all of science uh, certainly uh, to all of the uh, areas of physics that I know and uh, it may be even more uh, um, important in cosmology let me uh, let's see if i manage to explain it and then you think uh, you tell me what you think about it uh, as whoever does research especially in fundamental physics somehow is in a situation in which uh, you know it has to rely on uh, existing knowledge and models and theories uh, and take them very seriously is the best thing we have to understand the, 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 the world, and so we rely on them. Uh, even when we observe the world, we rely on a lot of theoretical uh, assumptions and models to, to have an idea of what we are observing. There's no such thing as, uh, you know, as a perception that is pure without any theoretical context in which we, we, we understand it, we phrase it. 
At the same time, uh, our job uh, is to revise uh, and improve, uh, possibly at the very basic level, uh, at the very foundational level, the same theories that we use, uh, that we rely on to, to move forward. So it, it sounds a bit like, uh, you know, those stupid guys in the cartoons in which, you know, they are trying to climb something at the same time uh, cutting the ladder uh, and <laughs> or something like that. And uh, it seems to me that in cosmology, it may be uh, very, uh, maybe even more central, this this sort of paradox, This uh, because uh, as you mentioned at the very beginning of our conversation, there are a lot of reasons to believe that our fundamental frameworks in, within which we construct models uh, have to be revised. That there's something fundamental about them that uh, will have to go, uh, some basic principle. Um, and so I would, I would like to ask you if, if you feel this kind of uh, tension. We, we observe the world, we, we observe it uh, on some theoretical basis, making a lot of theoretical assumptions. Uh, and at the same time, uh, we, 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 ne we will probably need to change those theoretical assumptions uh, due to the observations or uh, prompted by puzzling. Okay, maybe I don't agree. I, I actually think that there is continuous progress. Mm -hmm. And um, I measure, I would measure continuous progress in terms of the uh, number of issues that we can address, the number of data points that we, that we can explain. So I, I feel that specifically cosmology is, a, is not just just um, uh, turn around in circles and creating a new circle each time. But I think it's overall, overall it's advancing and it's becoming also more sophisticated, starting from very low ground. Is this? I think. But let me, maybe let me clarify what I have in mind. I mean, I'm, I'm paid to do science and I'm certainly not advocating for uh, going in circles. <laughs> So I do believe in scientific progress, and I, I can give examples that uh, support my belief. Uh, but what what I have in mind is more the fact that uh, you know, it's really the psychology of research somehow. So we we rely on uh, a given theoretical uh, framework or a bunch of you know uh, physical principles, uh, but still we constantly. Uh, uh, assess them critically on the basis of, two, of the new observations, even though to understand what we observed, we needed the, the, some, some, some theoretical framework. So it's more this, uh, somehow, this, uh, this tension between uh, uh, relying on something at the same time, uh, revising and uh, fixing it and modifying it uh, uh, while you keep climbing. Uh, so I, I'm not denying that we we go higher and higher. We keep climbing with a lot of effort uh, and so on. But uh, we are not. Uh, the bases are uh, both established, but under constant uh, revision. Uh, we and the revision, of course, doesn't mean that uh, oh uh, we just throw away whatever we had before. But uh, they're not taken for granted once and for all in all their aspects, even though we use the. Uh, several of those aspects uh, to move forward. Uh, this is what, what more what I, what, I, what what I had in mind is. Um, uh, I, I'm I'm fine with uh, with the fact that we keep uh, climbing up. Uh, I like. Yeah. So we have a theoretical framework, and then we work in terms of that theoretical framework. We keep revising uh, the models that we develop in terms of this framework, and then we fit more and more data. But then there'll be a point at which uh, we need a new ingredient to the theoretical framework. But it doesn't mean that we will have forgotten about the previous framework and the things that the previous framework explained. So, uh, we can reassure whoever is listening that uh, you know all this uh, discussion about revising the foundations and uh, you know 
uh, critical assessing our basic principles uh, is not just uh, to you know communicate later on that oh we were totally wrong uh, forget everything we said up to now in the last few centuries of uh, science uh, the story is actually totally different uh, no i think it's basically a, a um increase an increase which has a short what has periods short periods a rapid increase and then prolonged periods where um, the increase in not understanding is more gradual. But I think in this respect, cosmology is not different from other sciences. And can I ask you to conclude uh, a, a personal question? Go ahead. Why did you become a cosmologist? Okay, so now... We most of you will be surprised by the answer. It was completely by accident. <laughs> because I was a, it was, I was the upshot of a secret student seminar, which a couple of us had when we were graduate students at Harvard. One of my friends um, came to some of her friends at the beginning of a summer and said, let's do something different, something which no one with a PhD knows about. And then we started, it, this, this subject happened to be inflationary cosmology, which at that point, well, there was only one paper on it. And so we taught ourselves the uh, our basics to, to be able to understand this one paper. And then it's, this was uh, very interesting to me. And then uh, after that summer, I went to my PhD advisor and asked uh, him whether I could do my thesis on cosmology. He said yes, as long as I don't have to read the thesis. So it, it really was a was it was a fortuitous accent. Very good. So can we can we conclude with the message that you know uh, we we advise people to just uh, read uh, beyond what uh, they are, they are used to and uh, and uh, you know remain curious about whatever new comes up uh, from science, whatever is the corner, because it may become their life. Very, very, very true. I completely agree. Very good. So, uh, thank you, Robert. Thank, thank you. you so much. I hope you enjoyed the conversation, even half of how much I enjoyed it.